What is this, the Gilded Age? We're talking about a railway strike in 2022? Hey friends, Abdul Al Sayed here. We're going to talk a little bit more about this averted railway strike. But make sure to like, subscribe, tell your friends about our content, and hit that little bell so you never miss a new video. All right, so it's not 1922, it is 2022, and we're talking about a railway strike that was just barely averted. After 20 hours of negotiation between railway leaders, railway operators, and the U.S. government by way of the Secretary of Labor himself, Marty Walsh, and the President of the United States, the deal will have railway workers seeing a $24,000 increase in their salary over the next five years with $11,000 as soon as this deal is ratified. And most importantly, as we'll talk about a little bit later in this video, it addresses the broken leave policy, which has railway workers on call like 24-7. Can't see a doctor, can't get a tooth pulled, can't go to their little kid's baseball game. To put in context what this would have meant, it would have ground to a halt 7,000 trains, would have cost our economy $2 billion a day. And considering the fact that we're living in a world where inflation remains high, Grinding supply chains to the ground, not a great thing. So you understand why the labor secretary himself and the president of the United States were so focused on making sure that this didn't move forward. But today, I want to step back. I want to explain the role of rail in our economy, what happened to make sure that railway workers didn't strike, and what it tells us about the nature of labor in this economy. Before I go on, I want you to take a look at this pie graph. The proportion of movement of goods and services that proceed via rail. Now, that number is 28%, but I want you to think about something. Imagine Ford Motor Company is manufacturing a car and they have a part that comes in from, let's just say Mexico by rail. That's what gets represented in that 28%. But that car on the back end, even if it ends up getting trucked to a dealer in your community, well, the production of that car still relied on rail. And so you got to kind of think about all of these different modes of transportation as a bowl of spaghetti. You can't disentangle them. So it's not just like 28% of our economy gets affected. It's the whole damn thing. Because the products that get shipped via rail, whenever you see a train track crossing that doesn't look like an Amtrak, well, that includes nearly everything, whether it's food that affects your groceries, or it's fuel that affects your ability to buy gas, or it's lumber that affects your ability to get that table you ordered for your dining room on time. All of that, well, that's tied into rail. See, rail still matters. And aside from, you know, Joe Biden's hokey love of Amtrak, though we don't use rail as a form of transportation, as much as we really ought to, it does move a lot of the goods that we rely on every single day. Which gets me to the point that we probably should be relying on rail a lot more than we do. Frankly, if you go to almost any other country in the world, they take a lot more trains than we do because they're pretty effective, pretty efficient. You can put a lot more people on them. And in other countries, they move really fast, unlike in the United States. And if you've ever ridden Amtrak, I'm sorry, Amtrak, I'm sorry, Joe Biden, it's just not that efficient as a mode of transportation. I remember taking a bullet train in South Korea. First, the Wi-Fi was amazing. Second, I got to where I needed to go right when they said I would. And third, I would gladly do it again. Regularly, when I'm on the East Coast, I take the train between New York and DC and almost never get there on time. That, that is a question of whether or not we can still build good infrastructure in America. But I digress. The second point I want you to understand is because we do not think about rail as a mode of transportation, we have forgotten about the critical importance of the rail industry in our lives. And beyond the rail industry, because I, I don't really care about a bunch of railway owners because, you know, it's not the Gilded Age. What I do care about is the people who work in that industry. Now, there has been a lot of churn in that industry. I want you to take a look at this graph. You're seeing U.S. employment in rail transportation over time, and that has dropped substantially over the past 40 years. And part of the reason why is because rail operators have tried to squeeze as much profit out of their industry as they possibly could. So they've relied on fewer and fewer workers to do the work of freight transit. I want you to take a look at this next graph from our friends at More Perfect Union. What you're seeing here is a crisscrossing graph over time of the operating income margin in the green going up, how much a railway operator is going to make on a given rail transport versus the compensation and benefits of workers in that industry. And you see that going down. So what operators are doing is squeezing the people who work underneath them to make a buck. That's unfortunately common in American corporate capitalism. But I want you to think about the lived experience of those workers. The Federal Railroad Administration has been pushing a two-man crew rule, meaning you're required to have at least two people crewing a given train. And the unions have been supportive of that. So who's against it? Well, the operators. So they've been trying to force 
a single individual to operate an entire train. What that means as they press more and more railway workers out of the industry is that these workers are on call almost 24-7. You listen to their stories and they talk about not being able to make an appointment to go see a doctor, not being able to see their kid play baseball simply because they never know when they may be required to be on a train. That's not easy work, particularly if you're operating a train by yourself. So it's not just about compensation. It was also about leave, the ability to just take time off. Now, I'll raise this point to remind you that the workers who make our railroads work, well, they're invisible to us because we've forgotten that rail is a part of our economy in the first place. But these are the people who make sure that we get everything we need, whether it's that cereal we eat in the morning or that gas that you put in your car. They're the people behind all that. And they don't get the same kind of appreciation that they deserve. And so by keeping them invisible, the railroad operators have been able to have their way for a really long time. And that's what this strike was about. The good news here is that there's not going to be a strike because a strike would have been catastrophic for everyone involved. When our railroads grind to a halt, it's that the things that we need, we don't get them. And that can be really, really bad, particularly for the lowest income, most marginalized people in our society. But it's also bad for railroad workers. They lose out on their wages. And so it's a great thing that this isn't happening. And then finally, it's bad in an economy where we have inflation because of supply chain issues that the supply chain breaks down again. So you can imagine exactly why it is that the big guns were involved in making sure that the strike didn't happen. But all of that should remind us something, that we cannot forget the workers who make our economy go. So often in America, the people who are celebrated are the head honchos. They're the billionaires, the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezos. But underneath all of those folks are legions of workers who actually make the work possible. And when we forget them, what happens is they get taken advantage of. And so it's on us to remember them. It's on us to bolster them. It's on us to support them when they take on the corporate overlords who run the industries that they work in. So let's not forget those folks because they've been working on the railroad all the live long day. That was so hokey, but... Just, it just came to my heart. I had to say it.